dreams forevermore. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving, Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning as we move into the month of January. Uh, we want to wish, uh, it's 10 days later, but we can still wish everyone a happy new year. You know, everybody's going to have a new year, we hope, but not everybody's going to have a happy new year. So we'll talk about that in just a few moments, and that is what the Lord said in His Word about a real down-to-earth, very brief formula for living the best life you can. And we'll look at that in just a few moments. In the meantime, I want to remind you again that as you watch the introduction and the conclusion of the program. It's not like it, you know, it is now because I'm not preaching uh, at the Mayfair Church. Uh, uh, Dr. Bybee is preaching and doing a great job. So we started last year on redoing the introduction and redoing the conclusion, but we stopped because of the uh, virus. But we hope that this will get better, uh, that we'll get back to uh, working on a new introduction because I want you to know when you come, uh, you will be warmly received and you will get a blessing from your worship service. The Mayfair Church buys this, uh, pays for this uh, uh, program and has now for many, many years. And so I just want you to know, I hope if I'm not preaching somewhere, if, but, but well, I am now, but when I'm not preaching somewhere, I will be at Mayfair and I'll look forward to seeing you then. So we'll be working on the changing of that introduction as soon as we possibly can. Uh, I want you to also remember that I am preaching at the Madison Church. This is our second Sunday there, and I am thoroughly enjoying worshiping with these brethren. I've been with them before, uh, mainly on Wednesday night in their summer series, and I've always enjoyed worshiping with those wonderful people. And so I'd like for you to join us. We start at 10, at 8.30 on Sunday morning and 10.30. We have two worship services, and we certainly hope that you can, if you can come, if it's safe, we'd like for you to come and be with us. But that's true of all the churches of Christ in your area, in the Tennessee Valley. Uh, since I've been traveling since 2016, I've had an opportunity to visit a number of churches in the Tennessee Valley, and I find them to be good, God-fearing people that are just trying to do their very best to live for the Lord and have as much influence as they possibly can. So I extend that invitation to all the churches of Christ in your area. And if you're looking for somewhere to worship, please contact me at the Mayfair Church, and I'll be glad to find a place that's nearest you so you will have a place to worship with God's people. And that's what we're going to talk about in a moment. And that is when you're worshiping, and uh, you're worshiping, and there are some difficult things going on in church. And we'll be looking at, that, uh, looking at that in a moment. I'm going to offer now this uh, every day with God. So many people talk about what's in the Bible. A lot of people know what's in the Bible because they've read it, because they're still reading it, even though I believe it's not being read as much today as it used to be. It's not being preached as much today as it used to be. And so uh, you can't draw that conclusion. So, but what I'm, I've always done, and I don't remember when we started this, we give away this little calendar. 
And this calendar is a reminder for you to read certain chapters, certain days. And when you get to December, you would have read the Bible through. And that's a rare thing for people today. A lot of old timers have read the Bible through. I know a number of people at Mayfair that tell me they've read the Bible through. And they try to do this every year. This is just part of their uh, agenda, as part of their, uh, what, the way they live. And so, the, you know, the unique thing, and you've heard me say this, the unique thing about the Bible is you don't read the Bible, the Bible reads you. By that I mean it tells you the truth. It tells you how it really is. It doesn't sugarcoat it. It doesn't uh, play games. It doesn't play mind games. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons I love God's Word so much is because it's the bottom line. It, it doesn't, it, filibu- it does not have a filibuster approach to it. It doesn't beat around the bush. It tells you exactly like it is. And that's the reason uh, I wrote in my New Testament, I think when I first started preaching, that this book will keep you from sin and nothing but sin will keep you from this book. And I believe that with all my heart. And that's been a long, long time ago. But I wrote that in my first testament that I preached from. And I looked at that each time I was called on to preach the Word. And so when you think about the Word, you think about the the Bible has normal people in it. Of course, the apostles had the uh, baptismal gift of the Holy Spirit. The, the apostles were able to do miracles because the scriptures hadn't been written yet. And they had to be able to attract attention from people that uh, were listening to them, that were just ordinary people. They hadn't been to rabbi school. They, hadn't, they were not learned uh, individuals, but they were men. Like in Acts chapter 4, when Peter and James uh, were before, Peter and John uh, were before the Sanhedrin. And the Bible says, and they acknowledged that they had been with Jesus. Well, there was something about them that, that let them know that they had been with Jesus. And so I, I want this morning, as we begin the new year, to talk about this formula that Paul gives at the conclusion of the most difficult book in the New Testament. And the reason I say that is because it has 16 chapters in it, and yet the writer, Paul, the church, Corinth, had 15 sins. And I don't know of another book in the Bible, for like the book of Galatians talks about the law and talks about the law of Christ. The, the book of Ephesians talks about the church and how Christ is ahead of the church and, and, and so many wonderful scriptures in the, in the book of Ephesians. The book of Philippians, one of my favorites, is a book about joy. But 1 Corinthians is about sin. And it was all kinds of sin. Well, Corinth was a metropolis back then. It was a rich city. It was uh, filled with a lot of uh, sinful people, obviously, and many people think that, that Paul was in Corinth when he wrote the book of Romans, the first chapter, where he talked about some of the most unfortunate people in the world because of the decisions they've made relative to, the, to their life. He talks about men with men and women with women and doing things that are against nature. So they, they feel like that what he was doing, he was looking out of his window and writing, in, inspired by the Holy Spirit, at the city of Corinth. So the city of Corinth had so many sins in the church. Uh, they were taking each other to law and suing each other. uh, There was a man that was living with his father's wife, his mother-in-law. And there was uh, division in the church. They were abusing the Lord's Supper. They doubted the resurrection. And then right in the middle of all of that is the greatest chapter in the world on love, chapter 13, where Paul says love is a verb. It's not an emotion. It's not a Hollywood thing. Love is action. 
Love is doing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is thoughtful of others, you know. So right in the middle of all this muck, all of this horrible things that are going on, Paul says, let me tell you what's better. You talk about spiritual gifts in chapter 12. He said, let me tell you what's better than any of the spiritual gifts. And he said, that's love. So he concludes the letter. This is my point this morning. He concludes the letter by giving us five things we need to do. And it's in chapter 16, beginning in verse 14, when he says, be on your guard. Stand firm in your faith. Act like a man. Be strong. Do, every, do everything in love. Now, isn't that interesting that he would conclude, he still called these, this church, he still called them brethren. He did this in chapter 15 and verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren. But this is a sinful church. By that I mean there's sin in the church. And, and so because it's, somebody said we, we ought to understand that's what you find when you deal with people. You find trouble. You find problems. And when people become Christians, some of them do not stop doing what they've been doing. They continue to do it. And so there's sin in the church. You remember when Achan was uh, in the Old Testament, it's a good example of, 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 of stealing some things from a former city and hiding them in the tent, but the Lord had told them to leave everything over there, don't take anything with you, but he stole some gold and silver and, and uh, and then they went to battle and they were utterly defeated because the Bible tells the writer there's sin in the camp. There's sin among the Christians. There's sin among those at church. And so I, I just take great comfort from the fact that there's no perfect preacher, there's no perfect church, there's no perfect leadership. So let's do what Paul uh, admonished the Corinthian church to do in order to get rid of it. He didn't say all of that's okay and don't worry about it. Nobody's perfect. He wrote 2 Corinthians in order to thank them for dealing with all of their problems, including the problem of giving. And that's in the 8th chapter of 2 Corinthians. But the 2 Corinthian letter is about comfort. It's about the Lord pulling alongside of you and helping you deal with your problems. What 1 Corinthians means to me is everybody's got problems. The man that was suing another brother had a problem. The man that was living with his father's wife had a problem. The uh, people that were abusing the Lord's Supper were having, a, they had a problem. Those who were divided over spiritual gifts had a problem. Those who took a bad attitude toward a weak brother, that's the 14th chapter, had a problem. The uh, 15th chapter is one of the best chapters in the Bible on the resurrection. So there were some evidently in the church that said that there was no resurrection. And he says in that chapter, if there's no resurrection, then you're yet in your sins, your preaching is vain, and the apostles died for nothing. And so he deals with this and still calls them brethren. First of all, I like to think of this as a situation where a general is, is barking out commands to his soldiers. These are one-liners. That's the reason I like them so much. Be, uh, be on guard. That's all he says. Be on guard. Watch out. And, and this is what the Lord said when the Lord was in the garden at the hour of his crucifixion, uh, that the beginning of his crucifixion, he told his apostles, he says, watch and pray. And that's what be on guard means. It means watch out. Watch out about what? Well, watch out about the world. 
uh, Jesus said, and John said, uh, John said in First John chapter two, love uh, chapter four, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. So, and then and then in Romans chapter twelve, he talks about this. He says, love, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. In other words, in in Alabama language, do we live like everybody else? Uh, what, what kind of world do we live in? Uh, what kind of decisions do we make? Where do we go? What do we do? How do we act? How do we treat others? So the Bible, John tells us what's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And, and that sums up what uh, Satan did to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, and it also sums up what Satan did to the Lord in Matthew chapter 4. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's the world. That's what I have to look out for. That's what I have to make sure that I guard against. So he said, be on guard. It's like a general telling his soldiers, stand your post. Keep your eyes open. And, and I think it's in uh, 2 Kings chapter 20, we have an example of a soldier that was entrusted to keep uh, a prisoner, and the prisoner escaped, and the soldier was called in to give an account for uh, losing his prisoner, and he said, Lord, while I was busy here and there, he was gone. Well, that's no excuse. He didn't say, while I was asleep. He didn't say, uh, 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 somebody came in and, and offered me some money, and, and I took the money and let him run away. He said, while I was busy. So many times we think, if I'm busy, then that excuses me from doing what I need to be doing. And so he says, be on guard. Watch out for the world about, about us. Don't be a part of the world. Live in the world, but don't be of the world. And then we have the flesh within, and that's our weaknesses. Everybody has his own sack of rocks to carry. I've said that for 50 years, and that is I've got my own problems. Like the second chapter of Hebrews says, lay aside the sin which doth so easily beset you. I know the primary sin there he's talking about is the sin of unbelief, but I think we all have a weakness. We all have something we have to stay on guard about, the weakness, the flesh. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. That's what, what Paul is saying is there's, there's the physical body that the Lord gave me when I was born into the world, but then in that physical body there is a soul that God gave me that will live forever. And though I'm wasting away, look in the mirror. <laughs> I'm sorry. Look in the mirror. We're wasting away physically, but inwardly we're getting closer and closer to God because we're doing the things right here that he tells us to do. Watch out. Watch out for the world. Watch out for the flesh. And then watch out for the devil. The devil is a real person. Peter says he's like a lion, roaring, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. So that's the reason he tells them to stay on guard. Don't leave your post. And then he says, stay firm in the faith. And that is, do not give in. Uh, do not uh, sacrifice what you believe. Uh, uh, stand firm. That is, be a good soldier. See, Second uh, Timothy chapter two and verse, I think verse two through verse four, he talks about being a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say, no soldier entangleth himself in the affairs of this life. That, that is so interesting. When a soldier is called, he goes. It doesn't matter if it's Christmas. It doesn't matter, you know, if it's a holidays. It doesn't matter if he's on vacation. 
when a soldier is called into action, he drops everything and goes. And he doesn't get another job. He's not entangled himself. Isn't that an interesting word with the American Standard Version? He doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this. I'm so busy. I know we're in a spiritual warfare. We're in a spiritual battle. And yet I'm so busy farming. I'm so busy working at wherever. I hadn't got time to go to war. No, we're soldiers and we're called into duty and we're called to be on guard, to stand fast. And then he says, be men of courage. Wow. And if there's anything that has helped us deal with last year, and I'm hoping that the beginning of this year, this is coming to a close. But to be courageous is to do what you need to do in face of danger. You never know you're courageous until you get in trouble. And when you get in trouble, you make the right decision. And the right decision is your courage. Uh, the courage that we have from the promises. Somebody has counted them up. Would you believe it? There are 365 promises in the Bible. 365. Now, how many days in a year? The same amount. In other words, there is a promise for you and for me every day of 2021, just like there was last year. And so he says, I want you to be courageous. One translation says, act your age. That's the reason he says, men, be men of courage. Of course, that would be, be excuse me, <clears throat> be women of courage. Be teenagers of courage. That's a generic term that simply means in the original language, act your age. How long have you been in the church? How long have we you know, been uh, acting like we were followers of the Lord. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I acted like a child. <laughs> it's okay for a child to act like a child. He said, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I don't act like a child anymore. Of course, we all love children, but we don't like adults acting like children. We like it when adults put away childish things. And childishness, well, of course, we love our babies. We love our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And so, but that they can be so selfish. They can be so immature. They can be, uh, they can, uh, they can uh, just be so difficult to deal with because they haven't. Children need to be trained. That's what Proverbs says. Train up a child. Why? Because children need help. <laughs> children need training. They're not born with the idea of how to get along. They're totally selfish when they're born. And so we have to be patient with them. We have to love them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. That's a generic command that's generally followed, that's generally true. In other words, there's something within that person that will uh, let them always remember. And that's, that's interesting that so many of another generation that left the church have come back because they remember what's really right and what they really ought to do. And so he gives us advice, stay on guard, remember what is right, stand firm in your conviction, act like a grown man, act like a, act like a mature person. And then he says, be strong, be strong. Well, okay, I'll buy some weights and I'll be strong. No, he's not talking about that. He's talking about using somebody else's strength. We can't be strong within ourselves. I know this goes against what so many people in our socialistic world that we live in, 
Uh, but, but we can't be strong in and of ourselves. Paul says, I can do all things through my education. I can do all things through this uh, portfolio that I've put together and, the, uh, uh, and my bank book, the money that I've socked back, you know. I can do all, no, I can do all things through him who strengtheneth me. We need to read Ephesians chapter 6 because there, beginning in verse 10, he says, be strong in the Lord. I get my strength from the Lord, not from myself. If I depend upon myself, I'll fail. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. We can think we're doing right. Back to that Proverbs 3 that I mention all the time, and that is be, uh, that we need to trust in the Lord with all of your might. Lean not upon your own understanding. Paul, that's what Paul is saying here, that uh, you be strong, but not in and of yourself. Your strength comes from the Lord. And I can't tell you of the situations that I continue to deal with that people say to me, and they say in their prayer, I couldn't have done this had it not been for the Lord. If I hadn't had the Lord with me, I couldn't have made it. And I think that's, that is so generally true of, of so many situations. Uh, the getting back from the war, dealing with difficult family problems, uh, bearing a loved one. I couldn't have made it hadn't, if it hadn't been for the Lord. So he says, be strong. And then the last one, everything you do, 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 do it in love. Wow, what a command. Six, five short commands from our general, from our commander in general, to be able to live a quality of life. Like I said at the beginning, Happy New Year, yes. Well, really we want, to be, we want it to be a holy new year. And that is that we've given total commitment to these five things that Paul said to this troubled church. I thank you for watching. Our time is gone for now, but I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, may God bless you is my prayer. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ, a place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ. We're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. He 